thanks all for coming. Um, I want to speak to you about something which has been in the news a lot and what, um, uh, and especially since this protest has started, people have been saying that everyone here is involved in class warfare. Now I want to talk to you about real class warfare and what, what has been happening in the last uh, maybe a year or so in terms of government spending and government budgets. Um, and uh, just to show you how insidious and terrible this is, there is actually a, a, a term for it that uh, the media has. It's called um, expansionary contraction. This is uh, a policy which uh, the government wants to follow uh, and has been promoted by various various factions of the government. And like like uh, all kinds of policies which are mistaken or, or false. It really is an expansion, got an expansion, um, uh, um, an oxymoronic name, something that's expansionary and contractionary at the same time. Uh, let me let me start by by um, giving you the background a little bit. Uh, if you remember, in the summer we were all treated to this horrible spectacle of uh, the debt ceiling debates. Right? There was this whole thing about America's uh, about to default, and if it doesn't get its fiscal house in order, uh, the whole world is going to collapse. And uh, all of this is the fault of uh, Americans who have been spending too much and the government has been spending too much. And um, uh, as a result of all of this, uh, you need to co contract uh, government spending. You need to uh, make sure that all the kind of benefits that have been given to people are taken back because there's no way we can afford this. This has been broadly the kind of story that has been told to everybody. Um, and I want to tell you that not only um, is the story uh, wrong, it's destructive, and it's something that is actually um, uh, really class warfare in disguise. If anyone wants to follow what I'm going to say, there are some documents up here which are uh, pictures of what's actually going on in the economy, real stories about what's happening, about defic deficits and debt. And I think it's probably the most useful thing to take a look at that while I'm speaking. I'll point to, I'll point to various uh, diagrams if you want to uh, follow along. Uh, Chris is, is passing them along and he's also got two other documents which you may want to, uh, to take a look at. Right? I'll just give it a, a second till those documents go around. Alright. Why don't you tell us who you are? Oh, by the way, my name is Arjun Jayadev and um, hi, Arjun. Uh, hi. hi Arjun. Hi Arjun. Hi, I should have started off with that. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm an assistant professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Um, and actually this is a good thing, good thing to start off with because when I speak to my students, uh, in the very first class I give them a uh, very first um, uh, 102, economics 102 or 101, at the end of the class I give them a quiz and the quiz usually has some uh, um, a question some, which goes something like this. Imagine unemployment is very high and imagine that inflation is very low and then uh, imagine further that interest rates are very low. What should the government do? Now, I promise you, anyone who's taken my class, no one is going to say, cut the deficit in order to increase confidence in the economy. Right? Why are they not going to say that? Because that's a foolish statement. <laughs> when you have a situation where there's a lot of unemployment, the big problem is that you do not have enough jobs, enough, enough output, enough demand in the economy. If you contract at that point of time, you're going to worsen the situation. So none of my students answer that. Wait, but through the summer, politicians of every stripe were falling over themselves saying, we will cut more, we will cut the fastest, we will cut the most credibly. It was the most foolish thing I had seen in a long time, right? And, they be and it began to um, get a name that surrounded this particular policy. It's the name that I, I, I mentioned before, this, this policy of expansionary contraction, right? And if you've had the misfortune of watching business news, and I, I confess that I have this, this terrible uh, habit of doing that while at the gym, you'll see some guy, uh, every, every, every uh, talk show, there's some guy who'll stand up, there will be Bradley something or the other, and he's he says something like, you, you, you just hear these kind of keywords, government off their backs, taxes, regulation, businesses spend, job creation, blah, 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 Reagan. 
blah, 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 right? This is what you're going to hear. And they'll say, what we need to do is get our fiscal house in order, spend less, uh, and that will cause confidence in the economy. Now, this policy of expansionary contraction, uh, you would imagine that they had some evidence that it was uh, a lack of confidence in the economy or uh, interest rates that were too high, lenders not willing to lend, which was causing small businesses from not employing or from not spending. Now, if you take a look at the very first picture that, I'm, that is in the uh, handout I gave you, it's got all these kind of squiggly lines on it. All that is telling you is what businesses themselves say is the single most important problem that they face. You'll notice none of them say it's confidence in the economy. Most of the businesses are saying the big problem that we have is sales, is demand. People aren't buying our, our output. And why is that? We all know why that is. No money. Be there's no money. <laughs> people don't have jobs. People don't have incomes. There's no money around there. This is what's ailing business. It is not regulations, it is not taxes. They say that so themselves, right? So strike one, if you will, for this doctrine of expansionary contraction. But then you'll hear other people, and I think very reasonable people, say things like, hey, look, what's happened recently is there's been an explosion in public debt. Public debt in the economy has grown very significantly, and that's because government has gone wild, right? This is terrible overspending by the Obama administration or whoever it was in power and that's got us in trouble and our children and our grandchildren will pay for it. Right? There's only one thing that's true in that. What's true in that is that the debt, debt has increased. But you need to ask, why has debt increased? Is it because the government is spending too much? Is it spending too much on social security? As, as the claim goes, is it spending too much on uh, bridges to nowhere? No. no. What you see actually, and this is another picture I want to show you, is if you look at this pie chart, this pie chart is, trying, is telling you what has caused the rise in debt and try to break up the cause of the rise in debt. And if you'll see, the biggest component, over 50%, nearly 56%, is because tax revenues have fallen. People don't have jobs, and when people don't have jobs, they don't have money to pay taxes, and your tax revenue is going to fall. In the meantime, unemployment has gone up significantly and long-term unemployment is, is like we have never seen ever in this economy. For the first time since you've had statistics being um, generated on this, you are more likely to leave the labor force than get a job. This has never been recorded since the 1960s, right? So what happens when you have a situation like that? When you have a situation like that, you're going to have very humane things like unemployment insurance kick in. And so some, some things which, which the budget, under the budget heading of what's called mandatory spending. And that has taken about 11%. Only about 16% has been stimulus and other kinds of things. It really has not been a large stimulus. It has not been anywhere near the, near the level that people have, have been suggesting for right from the beginning that it should be. Right, so you have two situations. First, it is not the fact that um, interest rates are too high or regulations are too high or taxes are too much. What is the fact is that there's not enough demand in the economy and that you need demand in the economy. The second fact, it is not the fact that there's gov it's government spending gone wild. What is ha happening is tax revenues are falling and falling sharply. And that threatens to continue as joblessness grows, right? So these are two extremely important things which are happening. People don't talk about it, don't talk about it nearly enough when they talk about what's actually happening to the budget. All right. Maybe this would be a good time to move people over. We'd like uh -huh. to get you over into the shade and a little bit off of the sidewalk. Uh -huh. And thank you for coming. This is a whole forum. All right. Uh, can, may, may, maybe, maybe we'll just finish one more thing one and more we can point. go there for questions. One more question. point. One, one more, more quest, point. One more, one more point. If you, there have been people who have made the claim that, look, expansionary contraction has worked in other countries. Now, this has become, for, for those of you who have any kind of wonkish tendencies, this has become the kind of core set of arguments which has been uh, kind of making the round in, rounds in Washington. 
that it turns out two professors from Harvard uh, have made this particular claim. And as we know, pr professors from Harvard can never be wrong, right, about these kind of things. As it turns out, there have been studies which have been done after this by um, radical organizations such as the IMF, right, <laughs> which, have, which have suggested that this is absolute bunkum. In fact, or I have looked at this study myself very carefully and I've published papers about this. Of the 26 uh, cases in which they say that you've had expansionary contraction, most, has, most have happened when the economy is in a boom. It's very easy to pay down debt if you have a lot of money. Right. It isn't easy to pay down debt when you don't have money. This is, I mean, I, I feel yeah. sort of foolish saying this, but this is, this is the level of debate. That is, that is there in, in Washington at the moment. So we have three reasons, three strikes, you should say, to expansionary contraction. But let's, let's kind of step back for a second. That's not what's really going on here. What's going on here is a very thin veneer, right? a thin veneer of some sort of academic coating, some sort of logical coating to what people really want to happen. And what people really want to happen is a kind of pulling down of, of and a pulling away of social uh, social security, a pulling away of of things that people work to people have fought for for a long time. I think that people here should be very aware of what what's going on there, right? You shouldn't you shouldn't um, say, look, this is something that's happening out there. This is something that's happening in in uh, Washington, and this is something that we don't have any expertise on. You all have expertise on this. All it requires is reading a little bit about this and asking businesses what they want. All of this information is just so easily available if you just look up the internet. And this is something which you shouldn't um, allow people to get away with. Right? So I want to say no to expansionary contraction is probably what I would uh, end this with. This expansionary contraction is the idea that if you contract government spending and um, con contract contract government expenditure, you're going to have a boom because of confidence. That's not going to happen. And we've seen it not happening all over the world. All right. If there's any questions, anything, any follow-ups people have or anything about this, why don't we just move over there? And uh, Wait, I think, you know what? Unless, it's fine here. Unless people are happy. I think it's disruptive to move. All right, we're good. All right. Yeah. How, how big should the stimulus have been when Obama had the political capital in order to revive the economy from the collapse in, in the fall of 2008? How big should it have been, sir? It's very hard to make a very clear estimate about that, but from standard macroeconomic models, it should have been about a 1.3 to 1.4 trillion dollar. That was the standard. Krugman said something about 2.1 trillion. Is he way off or was he just far too high? There are estimates that go between 800 billion and 2.1 trillion. It depends on your, on your assumptions about this. So How big was it actually? The actual uh, stimulus was supposed to be 700 billion dollars, but, but because states have to contract at the same time, because states have to run a, a, a balanced budget, the actual effect was a lot less. Now you hear people say the stimulus didn't work because of the, I think, rather rather politically foolish thing that the administration and others did, which was to claim that it would cut uh, unemployment rates very sharply uh, down. It certainly prevented things from becoming a lot worse, but it could have been a lot better. Did you follow up? Just a follow up. Uh, of that uh, 780 stimulus, wasn't a lot of it tax cuts, which have a uh, not as great a multiplier effect from the economist's perspective? Well, from our perspective? I, I think from our perspective is a better thing, because economists, you know the story about people wanting a one-handed economist because of they say on the one hand this and on the other hand that, right? Um, I would say that uh, in this particular instance, tax cuts don't make sense because households are trying to pay down debt. They're not going to try and, and spend in the economy the same way that they would otherwise. This, this is the, the textbook case for more government expenditure, more infrastructure spending. Maybe more of a political question, but I'm wondering if businesses themselves are 
saying that their number one problem about the lake is sales and demand in the economy. Then why are the talking points of those business shows and other places like that still about taxes and regulations? This is a very interesting question. If businesses themselves are saying that uh, it's just to just repeat his, his question, if businesses themselves are saying that it is not high interest rates but sales, why are we hearing things from the from the um, in, on the talk shows which suggest that it's it's something else? Well, you are, businesses don't speak in one voice either. I, I think I think it's worthwhile to think about it really as certain sorts of businesses, especially financial interests. For whom it's not, it's, it is not uh, of interest to have a stimulus, right? And um, I, I think it's, I think if you try to make a monolithic claim on in favor of businesses having a particular set of uh, interest, that would be a mistake. Um, there are elite in the elite businesses and uh, businesses uh, groups such as the chambers of commerce which have claimed that it's taxes or regulation. I wouldn't want to say that it isn't that, but in general, those are very late claims and if you follow these these kind of pictures over time there's really nothing to that claim Arjun answers all questions about the economy <laughs> <laughs> even ones not about austerity yeah. what about the say we're broken yet they're sitting on record amounts of cash so we have that's, that, that's a very interesting uh, uh, the story the, sto the, the question is um, uh, that, that, that banks are sitting on two to trillion, three trillion dollars of cash, and yeah, bank, banks and corporations are sitting on very large amounts of cash, and yet they're saying they broke. Well, I would say that that that's it's disingenuous, but it's perfectly in keeping with the idea that the problem is sales and not interest rates, right? Because what is happening here? Why aren't firms investing? Because they're afraid that they won't be able to sell their products. And so giving them more money is not going to do it, give, provide any help to us. What will provide help is if, if consumers and households are able to actually have some relief. Right? If you're able to actually do more mortgage modification, do, do things which will actually allow households off the debt chain. It will actually allow for more demand in the economy and, and, and for these funds to spend their, their cash in a debt way. A, a, a political or an economic reason then that these two, two point three, two, two, three trillion dollars are not being invested right now. Are they being rational? That they do not know the near future and so why risk their capital? Or are they just trying to unseat Obama? Wow. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I can't answer that with anything but an opinion and, and I think the uh, I would say that it's 70-30. So 70 for the, the former and 30 the, the latter. I, I, and I'm not sure that um, if another president comes into place whether things will change actually because the circumstances are really bad for the final kind of um, um, locus of demand in the economy. For, for about 30 years, not just the US, but the world has depended on the US consumer, right? In order to go, and and that is actually come to a grinding halt. I, I can't see something in the next 10 to 15 years, short of very serious debt forgiveness, which will allow the economy to recover along those kind of paths. So you're giving a picture that's a lot more complicated than a lot of the signs I've been seeing around here. There are a lot of the signs, like there's one up on the corner that says it's all about the Fed, right. and that we need to end the Fed, and that's the, that should be our main thing. Like, do you agree with that? Is the Federal Reserve the main, the main villain in this story? You really know, um, this is, this is a, a tricky thing because, let's face it, the, the Federal Reserve has been um, not in, for the last 20, 25 years, I would say that it's not been the friend of American working people, right? There's a very interesting study which suggests that this is in the late 80s and early 90s. You could predict what the Fed would do by seeing the position of the AFL-CIO, and it would do the opposite of what the AFL-CIO did. This was actually a very strong predictor statistically at one point in time. Um, now, having said that, 
the Fed is, and, and one more point about the Fed, the Fed is privately owned, there are many kind of conflicts of interest with the Fed, there's many conflicts of interest around this. Having said all of this,